Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they come from the videos posted on YouTube and on Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media, such as from Mastodon or from Reddit. Sometimes these questions or comments come through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, could you do a video on installing a distro with manual partitioning and maybe some crazy dual boot setups of a few distros. I also have a question about swap partitions. I have read in the past that one must set up a swap partition size to equal the total RAM size for best performance. Is this myth or true? So you've actually got a few questions in that question. First about me doing a video on manual partitioning. Go check out any video where I manually install Arch Linux or Gentoo or you know any of those really minimal command line distributions where when you have to do the installation process at the command line. All of those, I have to manually partition the drive, typically with a tool like FDisk or CFDisk. I've actually done a video specifically about how to use FDisk as far as if you're unfamiliar with that tool and manually partitioning using that tool. Uh, now, as far as creating a, a dual boot setup on camera, I rarely do that because I don't typically dual boot. I don't dual boot where I need to worry about partitioning. I drive because in all of my machines I actually have multiple drives. I never have just one drive in any computer these days. And the reason I do that is in case I do want to install a second operating system, where does the second operating system go? It goes on the other drive, right? So you know instead of partitioning one drive to have multiple operating systems on a single drive, which is always problematic. You know, I like having every operating system on its own disk. And you know, this causes far less headaches. The other thing he asked was about the size of a swap partition. Should it be equal to the size of your RAM? And this is the advice people used to give like 15, 20 years ago. But here's the thing, uh, computers have changed a lot and the amount of RAM we put in computers has drastically changed here in recent years. So 20 years ago, having a swap the size of your RAM made sense, you know, but you know, I'd say 10, 15 years ago, people started dropping that because we started putting more and more RAM in our computers and having such a big swap partition was kind of unnecessary. So they said, you know, just put half the size of your RAM as a swap partition. So if you had 16 gigs, just make the swap eight gigs. And then, you know, as more and more people, you know, started adding more RAM to our computers, like these days, 32 gigs of RAM in a computer is not, you know, outrageous. I have 64 gigs of RAM in this machine. And I know some of you probably watching this video have 128 gigs or more of RAM in some of your beasts. And, you know, you can't create a swap partition of 128 gigs. That's just so much drive space wasted to a swap partition and swap is barely used you know sometimes the swap will never be used especially if you have a lot of ram the swap partition is probably never going to be in use anyway so why waste all of that space so i wouldn't i probably would never cre create a swap partition greater than about eight maybe 16 gigs but more than that you're using up a lot of your disk storage unnecessarily in my opinion next up is a comment and i believe this comment came from my video on GPT for all. He writes, Hey DT, thank you for this great video. AI is looking like it's the next big thing. I'm seeing actual job descriptions for training AI bots. Thanks for this information. And you're absolutely right. Everybody is hiring now for AI. If you're into programming and development, if you're going to school for computer science, everybody is recruiting people that have some knowledge of large language models and all of this AI technology. You know, that, that's the next big thing. If you go take a look at tech job boards, right? It's all about AI right now because you know, there's just not enough people and there's so much demand and not enough people experienced in some of this stuff. If you are one of these people that can wrap your head around some of this technology rather quickly, you can find a job paying quite a bit of money right now 
if you want to go that route. Next up is another comment, this one from my video on Aurora, which is one of the Universal Blue distributions. He writes, hey DT, just an FYI, I was doing more research on this distro after you showed it. The devs of this distro recommend to not use RPM-OS tree, but another tool called Brew. Either way, perhaps it was impacting the speed at which things were running when you were attempting to install software. Regardless, I'm really interested in this distro now. Thanks for showing it off. Oh, I appreciate the thank you. And I do agree that Aurora is a fascinating distribution. I may take a look at some of the other Ublue distributions. I know, you know Aurora, of course, is KDE Plasma. I'm interested in actually taking a look at possibly their uh, GNOME distribution, which is called Project Bluefin. I may do a video about that in the near future. And you're right, after that video, I did have a few people comment that RPM OS tree is not necessarily the recommended way to install software. It's there, you can absolutely use it. I mean, it's not like you're forbidden to use it, but you know, if you're wanting a, a better, more proper package manager, I guess they recommend Brew or Homebrew or whatever that particular package manager is. I've never actually looked looked at homebrew before. I do know it's supposed to be this universal package manager that should work on all Linux distributions as well as even Mac OS, but I've never personally tried it out. But if I do this video upcoming on Project Bluefin, the other universal blue distribution, I may actually play a little bit with the brew package manager on that video. And the next question, hey DT, why don't you grow your hair long like Fabio? And of course, he's saying this as a joke, as if I can't grow my hair out long, you know, have this flowing head of hair just like Fabio. I can actually do this rather quickly. So once again, all of you guys watching this video, please repeat after me. DT is not bald. Moving on. Hey DT, I run Linux Mint XFCE for many years and can I know which packages that I run are not open source? I know for sure the MP3 codex, but do not know much about it. Could you give me hints, thanks, and cheers from the tropical latitude Costa Rica? So I, I know that the English wasn't perfect in that sentence. Obviously English is not his first language, but I think we all get the, the gist of what he's asking. He's a Linux Mint user for many years and he's getting more concerned about free and open source software and he's concerned about having proprietary software on his system. He wants to know which packages on his system are non-free proprietary software and how does he go about checking this? And I've actually gotten this question quite a bit over the years and there's really several ways you can go about checking this. The very first thing, probably the easiest thing you can do is simply open up Google and type in the name of the program you're asking about, such as for example, Firefox. Type Firefox. Firefox license. Right? That's all you have to do. Most of the time, Google, because especially nowadays with some of the AI assistants in Google search, just type Firefox license and it's going to spit out, you know, the license for Firefox is MPL, you know, the Mozilla public license or whatever the, the program name is, you know, just type name of program license in Google. Chances are it will spit out whether it's one of the free licenses or it's a proprietary custom license. Another thing you can do is in Google search for name of program and then source code or name of program and GitHub. Uh, maybe it has a GitHub repository. If it doesn't have a GitHub repository, do a search for name of program and GitHub. GitLab, and if you can find a source code repository on GitHub or GitLab, then it might be free and open source software. See what the license is on that GitHub or that GitLab. If it's uh, under the MIT license or the GPL or the BSD license or the Apache license or the MPL, the Mozilla public license, you know, hey, that's free software. It's under some weird custom license that the uh, proprietor of that piece of software created themselves. Chances are it's not free software. Another thing you can do, there is this really cool command line program called called VRMS for Virtual Richard Matthew Stallman. VRMS is the Virtual Stallman, right? So on a Debian-based distro, because this program was written for Debian, so it really kind of only works on Debian, uh, but find VRMS 
in a uh, your distributions repositories if you're on a debian based distribution and run vrms it's going to spit out a list of all the programs on your system and out to the side of each name it's going to give you the license and at the end it'll give you a subtotal i think of, of what's free software and also what's non-free software there's a similar package available on arch specifically built for arch linux called vrms dash arch and it works in a similar fashion next up is a comment about uh, the adoption of new experimental software because on linux we typically move to the latest and greatest pieces of software you know kind of early we don't mind beta testing but this comment he writes hey dt i just wanted to point out that at least for the bsd operating systems they wait on adoption of new software for example wayland until it becomes proven according to their policies i love the stability of those systems but in general their space the bsd space is definitely for servers as opposed to desktops and he's absolutely right the bsd operating systems just the legacy of bsd is really it's always been more of a server operating system than a desktop operating system and they definitely focus on stability and that's why they're a little slower at adopting you know new technologies which could be a good thing uh, in certain use cases for example if you're using bsd as a server could be a bad thing if you're one of these people that want to use bsd as a desktop uh, like a desktop operating system maybe a development environment which you, where you want the latest and greatest software and you want some of this experimental stuff to play with in that case you know maybe you'd be more comfortable on a linux operating system but, you know, I, I, one of the great things about free and open source software is we have so much choice and you're always going to be able to find the right tool that suits you. Next up, a comment about Emacs. He writes, hey, DT, my init.el was a mess. Your video series, and he's talking about my configuring Emacs uh, video series. He says, your video series prompted me to redo the whole thing in a structured way. It's much better now. Thanks a bunch. Well, I appreciate the, the support there. And yes, I, I really enjoyed making that configuring emacs series i tried to keep things structured and organized I, i'm kind of a stickler when it comes to configuration files anyway it's not just for emacs all my configuration files i i try to keep them neat and organized as best as possible so those that are following after me you know anybody that's using my configs hopefully can more easily understand what's going on in those configs I, i'm glad that they helped you i also had another similar comment on some of the emacs videos i had this one here hey dt i loved your videos on doom you should definitely do some more and i've had several people ask me could i go back start using doom emacs again and do more video about specifically configuring doom emacs and honestly the configuring emacs as far as just standard vanilla GNU emacs that series of videos is most of it is applicable to Doom Emacs. So a lot of the Doom Emacs videos are also applicable if you're just using regular vanilla GNU Emacs. So there is some crossover. Now, obviously, there's some divergences with the way Doom does some things. But yeah, I may actually do more Doom Emacs videos in the future right now. I'm just using my own custom config as far as just I started with GNU Emacs and built my own config. But, you know, I, I wouldn't I'm not opposed to eventually maybe going back and trying out Doom again. And the final question for this edition of hey dt is hey dt i see people recommending linux over windows but why exactly what does linux do better than windows well i could spend the next several hours telling you all the, the reasons why linux is better than windows but i'm not going to do that you're a new user right you're on windows and you're thinking about trying out linux i will tell you for me when i first switched from windows to linux and it's been you know 16 years ago when i made that switch full time on my desktops I, i'll tell you some of the things that immediately on day one i noticed linux was far superior than windows and the very first thing was speed linux is so much faster than windows because it's not as bloated it doesn't have as many background services and there's not stuff running in the background you know as far as all the malware and spyware and things like that that are built into windows and you know if you've got this old windows 10 laptop windows 11 laptop you know you've had for a few years and it's starting to just run at a snail's pace it's become slower and slower over the years install linux on that thing and you will be amazed it will run like a brand new machine and i really think that's one of the reasons why so many people that when they try out linux stay on linux is because they're just amazed at that speed when you click on something you know it's instant 
you know, your windows just open instantly. They close instantly. Your menus open instantly and close instantly. There's no, hey, I, I double click on this icon on my desktop and I wait, you know, 90 seconds for, for the damn thing to open. That doesn't happen on Linux. The other thing that you'll notice on day one using Linux, because as soon as you install Linux, you're going to want to install some software that you want. Installing software, removing software, updating software is so much better on Linux than on Windows because Windows really doesn't have a central repository of software. Although I know in recent years, Windows is starting to add some package managers. I, I know there's something called Chocolatey. Uh, there's another one I think called Winget, but they're not, they're not good package managers. They're not the good package managers like we have on Linux where all of your software is in your distribution's core repositories for the most part. And because of that, it just makes installing and removing software so much easier and it makes updating all the software on your system as easy as clicking one button and all the hundreds of programs that are installed on your system they check to see if there's an update available and then if there is that takes that update you can't really do that on windows because uh, every program kind of handles its own updates its own way uh, you have to go about manually updating programs individually that's just a nightmare the, the software situation on windows is an absolute nightmare compared to what we have on linux and finally i think on day one of switching from windows to linux one of the things you'll notice is that linux respects you Windows doesn't. Windows treats you as a product, right? And they're trying to take advantage of you. Linux gives you choice, freedom, flexibility. You can do whatever the hell you want. Linux is not trying to constantly nag you with advertisements. It's not trying to upsell products to you. It's not trying to sell you on that next upgrade of the operating system or some premium service that's not really part of the operating system. But, you know, they're, they're always kind of trying to sell you something in these proprietary operating systems such as Microsoft. Microsoft Windows. You don't get any of that in Linux. So if you're a long time Windows user and you're thinking about maybe trying out Linux, hey, try it out. You know, make the switch. Uh, e even trying it out in something like a virtual machine or maybe a live USB stick, you know, dip your toes in the water a little bit. I think you're going to be amazed at what you find. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. Matt, James, Steve, Armor Dragon, Darloff, Daedalus, GDR, George, Lee, Matthew, Methos, Erion, Paul, Peace Arch and Fedora, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Solastri, Tianren, War, Gentoo, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon. I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.